Hi, I'm Mark Gober, author of the book An End to Upside Down Thinking and host of the podcast Where Is My Mind? On this show today, we're going to be speaking about consciousness and why it matters for our everyday living and also for leadership. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty Interview Series. I'm your host, Dolph Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything. Let me ask you, are you committed to up-leveling your leadership? Is your business a result of you, or are you a result of your business? And what if your thinking has been completely upside down on this one? Remember, you can chat about this episode or any past episodes on our LinkedIn and Facebook groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. As always, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you tune into podcasts. And we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get over there, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. You can also find us on traditional radio stations all the way from Philadelphia to Colorado and all the way in between as well. You can also catch us on Roku TV where there's over 100,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular listener, regular viewer, I want to thank you. Because of you, we have been voted the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners. For every show, we are grateful and honored to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. You can also catch us on Google Home and Alexa by simply say, saying play Dove Baron podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, a C-suite leader, a sales leader, an entrepreneur, or a leader in any capacity, you've heard me both here and on Sage speak about both that you are both the creator and the result of everything that you think and everything that you do. On previous episodes, we've spoken about the cutting edge of brain science and quantum mechanics of culture. But what could all this mean to medicine, to education, to science, to technology, to you, your leadership, and your business? What if you've been looking at the world through an upside-down lens or an upside-down way of thinking? Well, let's find out together. Our guest on this episode is Mark Gubber. He is the author, he's an author and a partner at Sherpa Technology Group in Silicon Valley. He's a former investment banker with UBS in New York and a former captain of the Princeton tennis team. After researching extensively, he wrote a book called an end to upside down thinking to introduce the general public to these cutting edge ideas in an effort to encourage a much needed global shift in scientific and existential thinking. Mark's book has been endorsed by leading thinkers such as former Harvard neuroscientist Eben Alexandra, Nobel Peace Prize nominee, Dr. <laughs> Irvin Laszlo, um, he, the, the Institute of uh, Noetic Sciences Chief Scientist, uh, Dr. Dean Radin, a University of Virginia Professor, Neurobiologist of Science, Dr. Ed Kelly, and many, many more. Please help me to welcome the author of An End to Upside Down Thinking, Mr. Mark Dubber! <laughs> welcome, Mark. Thanks for having me. Good to have you here, mate. Thank you. It's, uh, we're going to have a fun conversation here for sure, but we always like to start our show by asking this, who is someone that we wouldn't likely know or wouldn't likely suspect who maybe has had a major influence on your life? It's easy to pick the people that are, you know, always in the spotlight, but there's oftentimes I find that leaders are influenced by somebody that most of us wouldn't know. 
who might that be for you? Well, the first that comes to mind is a man named Dr. David Hawkins, who's no longer living, but he's written some very influential books that had a big impact on my book and how I think about life generally. He was a psychiatrist who became essentially enlightened, reached very mm-hmm. high states of consciousness, and he has profound insights on life. So he's been a big yep. impact. Power versus Force is one of the greatest books ever written. Great book and uh, a great thinker. And I highly recommend that people reach out to, to find out more about him. So let, let's jump into this whole big, which is a huge, huge conversation around consciousness that we are definitely not going to solve in one hour. But however, we're going to dive in. So from your point of view, from all the research that you've done, what would you say is the biggest misunderstanding about what consciousness is? Because there's all kinds of places we can go with this, and people talk about consciousness in very different ways. It's even become a common term in uh, something called woke. You know, people think of that as being consciousness. So what do you think is one of the greatest misunderstandings of, about what consciousness is? Well, first, the way I define consciousness is our subjective experience of being alive and being aware. So when I say that I'm speaking to you right now, that subjectivity that's having the experience is what I mean by consciousness. The misunderstanding that I think exists is one that I used to have, uh, which is that the awareness that we all have right now, that consciousness comes from the brain. And I thought that was just a foregone conclusion that our science knew that was the case until I started researching this a few years ago and found out, number one, science has no clue how that could happen if it does happen. And I would argue Mm -hmm. that the science suggests the brain does not produce consciousness. Right. Well, you and I, you know, we talked about this previously. You and I both think of the brain and the mind of separate things. However, in fairness, there's still a good deal of neuroscientific research going on looking into what parts of the the brain might produce uh, the mind? Because we see those, you and I see those two things as very separate. Um, talk to us about um, the the that battle, if you will, between consciousness studies, which go f- back for millennia, and neuroscience, um, which has been trying to understand consciousness, of course, in fairness, um, and, and putting consciousness in different parts of the brain. I think there would be no debate in any area of science that the brain has something to do with the way we experience the world around us. Mm -hmm. The question is whether the brain is producing that experience or if it has another relationship. Or maybe the brain is like an antenna receiver, or I think more precisely, a filtering mechanism. So the way I think about it is that there's a much broader reality than what we typically experience, and the brain actually limits it. So neuroscience is still important because the way we limit consciousness will impact how we experience life. It's just recontextualizing the brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's really worth everybody just stopping for a moment and considering that, that you know, uh, the, the analogy I've given to people many times is, is understanding that if you're always wearing red lenses, everything has a shade of red. And that is what your mind is. Your mind is a set of lenses through which you perceive and how you perceive it is not necessarily how it is. And so let's just, let's go there because people are going to want to go there. Let, let's use the analogy that everybody loves, um, especially it's the one that I get asked about when I speak about the subject, which is the matrix, right? Everybody loves that, that analogy. Do you, do you see this, at, at the mind as a, or the brain as a, 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 a decoder of the matrix into a context that we can cope with or do you see it as something else Hmm. well i think there are parallels the analogy that i typically use is one from dr bernardo castrop who says we should imagine that all of reality is like one big stream of water and each of us is a whirlpool within that stream meaning we have kind of an individual localized experience but we're fundamentally connected as part of the big stream so i think there are parallels to being connected to if you want to call it a matrix or some something beyond what we perceive as an individual and the brain is a way of decoding and filtering and maybe even receiving what's beyond our perception yeah now you are a excuse me but you are a relatively young man and um I would say a, a very young man in the context of the the world of consciousness. Um, you know, that something happened for you in 2016, we can go into it in a moment, but why do you think that you've gotten the attention of people like Dean Redden, um, 
uh, Harvard neuroscientists, uh, Eben Alexander, and even myself, people who have been involved in consciousness and consciousness research journey for, well, some of us longer than you've been on the planet. <laughs> right? So, you know, I was studying this stuff before you were born. So, and Dean was definitely as well. So, so tell us, why do you think you've gotten the attention of these folks? Well, what I've tried to do with the material is, is really simplify research that has been out there for a long time. So I'm not really saying anything that new. What I'm hoping to do is put it into a new context that maybe someone more in the mainstream can understand that maybe they didn't before. I think that's part of it. And also, I think my background is helpful in reaching new audiences. I work in finance. I used to do investment banking, like you said. I'm a partner at a Silicon Valley strategy firm. So I think because I have that background, so certain people might be more likely to listen to the first few sentences of what I say, uh, mm -hmm. whereas maybe a scientist would have a harder time connecting. Yeah, I mean, because you've got to, I mean, we live in a world where ageism is very real. Um, and ageism, uh, in the way that we think of it, tends to, um, tends to be, um, you know, oh, you're old. <laughs> but, you know, it also works the other way around as well. And I can remember um, when I first started speaking, I was in my 20s. And, and I remember thinking, geez, I wish I was older because people would take me more seriously. And then as you get older and you realize, well, you know, there's so many brilliant minds who are younger than me. And, you know, many of, many of the people that I interact with are millennials who are much younger than me. You know, and I think, you know, oh, it's kind of like I'm younger than I am. So, you know, it's, that ageism thing is definitely, do you find that you bang into that? I haven't really experienced it. And I think it's, it's mostly because I'm not claiming anything myself. I'm putting other people's research together and that's the basis of the conversation. Right. And I think that that's an important thing for everybody to grasp because, you know, in the world of um, thinking, uh, not at the level you and I are talking about, but positive thinking, that kind of thing. Uh, many people, if I say, do you know the book Think and Grow Rich? And they'll say, yes. I mean, everybody knows that book. Um, do you know when it was written? About a hundred years ago. Wow. Okay. Do you know who wrote it? Yes. Napoleon Hill. What was Napoleon Hill fa famous for? Well, all this great thinking. No, he wasn't. He was a reporter. That's what he was. He was a reporter. And, you know, we remember his name, but he, he took 16 of the top thinkers in the world around certain things and, and brought it together and, and created something that was bite-sized, digestible for people to get. Do you feel like that's part of, is that, is that part of your mission? You're trying to make it sort of digestible for people? Absolutely. And that's what my book, An End to Upside Down Thinking, was trying to do, and my podcast, Where Is My Mind, which literally takes bite-sized clips of interviews with people like Dean Radin and takes the highlights for someone who doesn't have much time. Mm-hmm. Because this is, uh, I mean, this is, as I said, this is something you can dive in for 150 years. I, like I said, I've been in it a long, long time, and I still feel like a neophyte. So it's, you know, it's, it's interesting that you're taking it into these bite-sized pieces. Do you feel like people are getting it though when you do that? The reception I've gotten has been very positive. And as an author, I'm learning that I don't always get feedback from everyone re that reads the book because I don't know who's reading it. Where I get the most feedback is when I'm giving a talk and mm -hmm. people in the audience can directly engage. And the feedback I get is they say, wow, I've heard this material before, but you're presenting it in a new way where I'm understanding it differently. Right. So, so tell us about th that moment for you. You know, I mentioned it, 2016 is not very long ago, and uh, that was the catalyst for you. T tell us about that moment for you. It was gradual and then not gradual. It, gradual in that I, I heard a podcast. Like consciousness. <laughs> like consciousness. gradual and then not gradual. <laughs> yeah. Well, I heard, I heard a few podcasts that led me to listen to more podcasts that le then led me to read books. So in the beginning, it wasn't like my, my worldview changed overnight, but within the course of a few weeks or months, it definitely did. And where I came from, my just educational background taught me that the brain produces consciousness when we die. There's no consciousness anymore because the brain's not functional. And that has a set of implications about how we think about life. I used to think life was meaningless. I was kind of going through the motions, even though I wouldn't say it that way. And then no. I was being exposed to new science that questioned everything. So I became pretty much obsessed and spent a year uh, just researching as much as I could and then wrote the book at the end of that year in the summer of 2017. Right. So 
what was it about that podcast for you or those podcasts for you that, you know, I mean, lots of people listen to a podcast. Lots of people get inspired by a podcast. Lots of people maybe even have a shift in thinking, but what was it for you that, that had you start mainlighting <laughs> quantum physics and quantum thinking? You know, what was it that made you go down that road so far that you felt, you know what, I should write a book. Hey, you know, I'm an investment banker. Um, I'm a Silicon Valley world. I should write a book about consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't happen overnight. The first few podcasts were just interesting to me. Oh, wow. I, I didn't know that this science existed. And then it reached a point, uh, probably a few weeks in, where something hit me and I said, wait a second, I need to really think about the implications. If this is actually real, then I need to rethink my whole life. And when that happened, I really dug deeper. And then the more I researched, the more I realized that I did have to rethink life. So talk to us about that crux where you talked about, which was going through the motions, although you would never have admitted that because most people would never admit that. It's not you, it's most people would never admit that. So Talk to us about going through those motions and feeling like, hmm, there's something missing. Uh, you know, how did that shift you? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just, I used to think life was meaningless. And I thought that's what science was suggesting, that we live in a random universe. Our, our sense of awareness is just a product of chemicals in our body. And when the body stops functioning, it's over. And therefore, if we want to try to create meaning in life, we can do that but it's just a rationalization. And mm -hmm. I thought about that rationalization a lot where I said, well, maybe I'd win a big tennis match. I was a competitive tennis player or I'd lose a big tennis match. And then in the back of my mind, I'd say, Mark, why do you actually care? Because mm -hmm. nothing matters in the end. And that was the battle I had going on in the back of my mind. Same thing with the business deal. I'm really happy about this business deal or I'm not happy about the way it went. Wait, Mark, why does it matter? It doesn't matter. And that's where I was a few years ago. So, so why do you think the, you know, for the average reader, the average even person listening to this, why do you think that the study of consciousness uh, should matter? Ultimately, where it leads us is to thinking about our own identity. And that's mm -hmm. huge. So the way the conventional view in science teaches is that our, our identity is our body and everything that we experience is just a product of our body, but our identity is this physical form. Where I think the science points after all this research is that it's the other way around, that our identity is actually the consciousness that's experiencing this right now and the body is the vehicle for that experience. So when that really sinks in, it impacts everything we do in life, whether it's leadership, business, sports, relationships, everything, because we think about ourselves differently. Well, let's, let's, let's go to that. How, how do you see it applies to leadership specifically? To me, the, the biggest way that I've seen it impact my business life and leadership life is the perspective that we're all connected. Mm -hmm. I used to think that we were not connected, that we lived on the same planet. We have similar genetics because we're the same species, but there's no fundamental connection. And here, what we're talking about with the stream of consciousness is at the fundamental level of reality, we are connected. And I'll give an example from my book and also my podcast. It's called The Life Review Phenomenon that's reported in a near-death experience. And a near-death experience is where a person, their body is basically shut off or completely shut off. And yet they have a vivid or, <clears throat> excuse me, a lucid memory that occurs during this time. So no brain, and yet there's a functional consciousness. It's one of the pieces of evidence that people point to when they say maybe there's a functional consciousness that's not dependent on a body. What's often reported is a life review during this state when the brain's not on. And people talk about reliving their whole life through the eyes of the people that they impacted. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the people that I interviewed, Daniel Brinkley, he fought in Vietnam. And what he told me is that in his life review, which he had four times, he had four near-death experiences, he relived the deaths of the people that he killed through their eyes and felt their pain, but then also felt the pain of the child that would no longer have a father. So in this, whatever you want to call it, alternate state of or alternate dimension of consciousness, people relive things in a new way. They feel the interconnectedness in a way they don't feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that finding alone, or even the possibility of that finding, would impact how we think about running an organization or treating people in a leadership context. Yeah, I, that's why I'm so fierce about conscious leadership and really understanding what conscious leadership is. Uh, Daniel, uh, I've known for many, many years and, uh, 
uh, and he, you know, he talks about being a uh, being promoted from 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 sergeant to to uh, sergeant major asshole, <laughs> and, and before he got hit by lightning and and got welded to the, his boots got welded to the floor. Um, I mean, you know, it, and I have experienced it. I have had five near death experiences, so I know what that world is like as well. And you know. Um, and that, and I was already studying consciousness before that happened. So um, I, I get it. Um, but I, so here's the, here's the thing um, where I get the challenge with this is yes, you and I get it. We understand the consciousness. We understand um, the, the, this can have profound impact on the way that you see the world. But we also know there is this thing called the egoic mind. And the egoic mind looks at life separately, not as conjoined in any way, not as uh, entangled in any set way. It sees everything as separate and, and identified and therefore um, wants to cling to what it has and sees all potential of anything else as loss. So therefore, I present this information in the, in the context of what I know it, um, Dean presents it, or whoever, Daniel presents it, or you present it, we still have people, people are still going to hold on to say, well, well you know what, you know, I'm going, I'm going with what I believe. And sometimes that is a very strongly religious belief of, you know, well, you know, I, I'm going to heaven and Jesus is going to save me or there's nothing and I'm an atheist and I'm just going to die and that will be the end of it. Um, and, or, so you can have both of those categories and at the same time still have, but while I'm here, I got to make some money and I got to look after my family and it's all about that. So talk to us about the movement that you're trying to create in the context of shifting people into that bigger understanding outside of the limitation of their own egoic sense of reality. Yeah, you touched on really the key point. My approach so far has been much more of an intellectual approach rather than an experiential approach. I'm giving people data for those who need data. Some people data isn't what does it. For others, they like to see the science. I found the biggest uh, where, where people have the biggest shifts is when they have a personal experience with something, whether it's a near-death experience or something as simple as a synchronicity, where there's a coincidence where they do the math in their head and they say, wait, something's going on beyond mm -hmm. chance. And I think when people have those experiences, it's up to them to take the information or not. And I, I don't think it's my job to force that on anyone. Really, I'm just trying to make the information available to those who want it. And to those who do want it, it can be transformative because I know for myself life can be meaningless without having this bigger context. But, I, but there's also, see, so here's the thing I'm looking for, Mark, with you, which is, I'm sorry, I don't believe you, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, I don't believe the podcast changed you. Um, and I'm not suggesting you said that, by the way. So I'm just sort of niggling at you a little bit. Um, because my, my research in my own life, whether that is, personal experience, uh, my research with the people I've worked with for the last 35 years, and my research generally in psychology and in quantum physics, is that we don't change because we find an idea. Um, we know that. The research shows that people don't, you know, oh, you know, they, that idea has that as a seed has to land on fertile soil. And if it doesn't, and it's a wonderful idea and it's spectacular and it's life changing. We might look at it and go, wow, that's a life changing idea, but there's nowhere for it to take root. What made it take root with you? Hmm. Yeah. Something made it take root. I think you're right. Cause I have presented the information to other people and there's nothing fertile for it to sit on other people. It is. I think that I had a curiosity about the nature of reality. I don't know where that comes from, but I, I've wanted to understand what we're doing here and why things matter to us so much. So I think that's part of it. But then also, I did have some experiences that seemed to validate what I was researching, whether they were synchronicities or speaking to people that have extraordinary abilities of consciousness, like psychic phenomena, which I write about, people who could do those things in extraordinary ways that confirmed the research. So I was having many experiences, I would say many relative to a near-death experience, that were 
you know, confirming or, or validating the fertile soil that was already there. Yeah, but do you, do you have any sense of what that fertile soil was for you beforehand? Because I, I'm going to tell you my thesis on this, and I've written about this extensively. I wrote a thesis on it, which is that the fertile soil is pain. The fertile soil is pain. There's something happens that um, is so painful that we can't bear it, and we're looking for something. We're looking for a salve, and so we in the looking for the salve, we go well. I'll need more money. Uh, I'll need more sex. I'll need more drugs. I'll need more rock and roll. I need more stuff. And then I go, oh shit, that doesn't work. That's now added to the mix of the of the fertile soil because it's now like I've got pain and I've got emptiness. Okay, so I'm wondering what it was for you for that seed to land. Yeah, well, it's a, you make a really good point. I think it was a lack of of meaning, having a really strong lack of meaning in life that caused up and downs. But I didn't feel like I was looking for something new. This just happened to come up, but I think you're right that there was fertile soil because I was trying to understand what I was doing here, and without having any meaning, that can lead to pain and nihilism and a lot of negativity. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating for me because the private clients I work with are incredibly successful, and if you ask them, you know, generally, are you happy? Oh, yeah, life's good, man. You know, I got that big house, I bought the yacht, you know, I've got the, the Lamborghini or whatever it might be. Uh, I'm happily married, I've got three children, two are in college, whatever it is. But that deeper question of questioning, like, what is this all about when all that stuff's gone? It's like, ooh, that's what bu bugs me and bothers me. And I, and I believe that it's very interesting because my clients are very, very successful. And I, I'll say to them, I believe what drove you to higher and higher levels of success was your search for meaning. But your search for meaning got lost in your pursuit of finding more success. And it's like, so until you get to the end of that road and you go, huh, this is, this is not working. I've not got more meaning that then loops back into the pain that then becomes that, oh, now you've ripped the scab off and the soil is ready. And I think that that's what you're doing. And that's what I love about what you're doing is you are, you are saying, here's the seeds. And, and I think that it's a great lesson, not just for you, but for all of us. I know it was for me when I was your age, it was a massive lesson for me, which is I can't force the seeds into concrete. I wanted to, <laughs> I tried to, and you're not doing that. And that's, you know, and I, and I salute that and I support that. And that's wonderful. I got over that. Fortunately, that's what falling on your head will do from a dizzy height. But uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, I want to I want to address something that you were kind of alluding Thank to. Thank you. I, I experienced myself, and there's a term in psychology called the hedonic treadmill, where you achieve something and then you kind of end up back at your baseline state. So, mm -hmm. achieving something through the external world never leads to any actual movement. There's kind of a return to baseline in terms of happiness, and that was something I always felt. And I remember actually talking to my buddies when I was working in investment banking, and we'd be up until four in the morning. We would ask ourselves, "What is happiness?" And I never had a really good answer to it because I think all of my answers were looking for something external. And anytime I would get that external thing or achievement or whatever it is, I would return to baseline very quickly. Yeah, um, because the, the key thing is understanding that, not, not you, but for all of us, is that um, happiness is transitory. Uh, happiness is dependent upon things. Joy is not and it's vastly different. Joy is a state of consciousness, whereas happiness is a state of emotional transition. So I feel happy, why? I just got laid. I feel happy, why? I just got a million bucks. I feel happy, why? The sun's shining, all external forces. But I feel joy, why? Because I choose to feel joy, because this is the place where I wish to live. Mm, what are you talking about? Whatever you're on, give me one of those. <laughs> I, whatever, whatever flavor of red pill that was, I'll have two. <laughs> so let's talk about one of the areas that I just particularly love, which is, you know, uh, and and because I, I tie it so much, and I want to hear your points on it too. I tie it so much to building as a leader in, in the leadership work, building culture. 
right? And we, you know, there's a lot of stuff around culture that's strategic and and and, and misses the point so much. So I want to come into something called that you're very familiar with, which is non-local consciousness, non-local quantum entanglement. Uh, Dean Radin wrote a lot about it, but Einstein always, almost famously, also famously called it a spooky action at distance. Um, talk to us about how you see that in the context of leadership. Hmm. Well, this phenomenon you're speaking of, non-local consciousness, it does come back to quantum physics, potentially, the idea that two things that are far away from each other, there is a correlated reaction at the same exact instant which Einstein tried to disprove. And when he tried to disprove it, he showed that it was actually a real thing. And now it's accepted yeah. in science. And yeah. uh, it, it's, it's yeah. Einstein's like, I do not believe this quantum stuff, but I'm going to prove it, which is really great. That's how a scientist works. I it's love how that. science should work. It is. Yeah. And I think that's where we're headed. And Dean Radin is one of the pioneers. He wrote a book called Entangled Minds. And actually, Erwin Schrodinger, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, he said, in truth, there is only one mind which points to this kind of one interconnected stream of consciousness that we're all a part of. So how does that tie to culture? I, I think it, it, it recontextualizes how we think about others around us. If we think about others as separate, then that has implications for how we think about building a culture or, bu or building a society or building a business. If we're all facets of the same one mind, the same stream, then I think there is a, a sense of uh, collective caring that is automatically built into the culture because it's just rational to do so. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, uh, in, the, in the world of resonance and understanding quantum resonance fields, if you understand that if you create a culture based on the dominant resonance of the leader or leaders, then that has an attracting force to it. And that, that resonance then means that you're creating people around you. So what happens is you will find that, and I talk about this when I talk about uh, fierce loyalty and building fierce loyalty in your organization. If your purpose is solid, people are pulled to that because they're pulled to the emotional content of that consciousness. But if it's misaligned, you've, you're losing your people left and right, uh, or you've done purpose work. You think you've done purpose work, but what you've actually done is developed a mission statement. People are not going to connect to that. And it's that simple, you know, the simple analogy I give uh, in my, in two of my books is if, if there's 40 of us working at a company and we all stand outside and we're all, all holding old fashioned uh, radio sets and we're all randomly tuned to whatever station and we turn the radio on, what do we have? And the answer is noise. You have 40 radio sets. But then I tell everybody at that meeting, turn your radio set to 94.5 which is the classical musical station. And at that, as we all tune together, over the next few seconds, suddenly we get to ba 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 bum ba 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 bum We get Beethoven's fifth. We no longer got noise, we've got a symphony. And that is what culture is, is getting everybody to move into a quantum messaging together to create the entanglement that a culture can be at its most powerful. And it's fun. It's a, it's a massive understanding that is so simple and powerful in shifting us. How do you see this, what you're putting forward in the context of trying, cause I know you, it's one of your goals is to help people see how we are in the world differently. How, what, what is your hopes with this in the context of the global situation? I mean, we've got, you know, we've, we, you know, you and I are talking about an entangled consciousness. Um, Schrodinger talked about a single mind. Young talked about a single mind. Man, we're becoming more tribal again. We're becoming more tribal. So talk to us about what your thoughts are on what you're trying to do in the context of that. Well, I think when I look at the world's problems today, whether they're interpersonal problems or problems between nations or cultures, they stem from a misunderstanding of reality and from acting from a place of separation. I think that's the root cause of many, if not all of the world's problems. So yeah. while my endeavor so far has been primarily scientific, the implications are our society wide. They apply to everyday living. So to me, it is about appreciating the interconnectivity. And as you were talking about some of the uh, kind of resonance with the leader, you're reminding me of some studies that I reference in my book and on my podcast, where when there is a global event that's occurring, 
um, machines that are, are spitting out random numbers, so zeros and ones in a random fashion, the machines behave non-randomly around the time of a major global event when there's a group coherence on the planet, which suggests that when we are focused in the same emotional or intentional direction, there's an actual impact on the world around us. Yeah. It, and again, this is phenomenal research with the eggs and what was done with placing those. And, and like you said, when 9-11 uh, took place, there was a shift in, in, the, in, the, in the data that should be random that was no longer random. Even the death of Lady Diana, that shows up. I mean, there's things that you know, people don't, wouldn't expect uh, that shift the consciousness of the planet. And you know, that's part of my concern when I see these uh, large egoic figures, uh, authoritarian egoic figures, because there is a larger implication. What's your sense of that when we look at, you know, um, whether is a, someone's a fan or not a fan of Donald Trump, um, he is a major force on our planet right now um, at a level of consciousness that is a shift in thinking. And I don't think he's a, I don't think he's the root cause. I think he's actually a, he is a result of, but he's now become a, a bigger catalyst. What's your thoughts on how that is working? Well, I agree with you that any individual is not the problem. It is a result. It's a symptom of something much broader. So that is a manifestation of maybe a, belief, a widespread belief in separation or not a, a good enough collective understanding of our interconnectedness. So I, I think that we can actually learn a lot from disagreements. If we see things in the public that we don't like, it is, I think, pointing us to broader problems in society where there's an imbalance. So I think we're just being shown right now where there are imbalances in the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the part of separation um, is also very, very tied into uh, materialism. And um, I will say that I'm a materialist. I'm a capitalist. I like nice clothing and I like living in a nice home and I like to eat well. So, you know, and I'm certainly not signing up to become the next leader of the Socialist Party. Um, but at the same time, I'm not bound by those material things. Talk to us about how you see that, because there are a lot of people now, again, it's part of that separation and that struggle. We've got one side, which is the OAC and, uh, and even Bernie and this idea of socialism, which is actually not true socialism, but the idea of socialism. And then this idea of this crony capitalism, materialistically driven. Um, what are you hoping I mean, are you hoping, let, let me rephrase that, are you hoping that the, the what you're putting forward in your book and, and the research that you've come up with and you've discovered, are you hoping that that will impact the materialistic thinker? I, I'm hoping that it will at least cause people to question priorities. And I don't think all of this implies that we shouldn't like nice things or want nice things in life. We still exist in the world. So I think it's perfectly fine, even within this broader framework, to Ooh. enjoy the nice things in the physical world. So I don't think it totally wipes out uh, materialist perspectives. It just puts it no. into a new context. And I think that's the important thing for, for people to realize where their priorities and values are and why they're there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and oftentimes we do lose that uh, because we become so competitive and so materialistic uh, around uh, how these things work. What, um, Talk to us about how this is, how this has specifically changed the way that you look at your world. You know, you talked about meaning, um, but how has it directly impacted you? What is the, the tangibles of how it's impacted you? And, how, you know, because you're still part of a Silicon Valley company. You know, you have your background, as you said, in, in, the, in the world of banking. Tell us how it's impacted you and how you see the world. I think it's my outlook is just completely different. I'm much more aware of how my actions are impacting other people. And that's ultimately why I did the book, why I'm doing interviews, why I did my podcast is to help others that are open to it. Whereas before, it's not like I didn't want to help people. I just didn't think about it in the same way because I had a much more, uh, I don't know, separated perspective where I thought 
life was meaningless. It's just me. And there are other people here who I want to treat well, but it's kind of optional. And now I think it's much more mandatory and rational to be altruistic because if we're just one mind and we see this in the life review reports, how you treat others is how you end up feeling yourself. So mm -hmm. I'm just much more attuned to that in everything I do. But like you said, my life may be on the surface, other than the fact that I'm now doing things publicly around consciousness, I'm still working. It's the same thing. It's just I have a new perspective in every act in my life. Yeah, it'd be, there was a piece in Daniel Brinkley's story that really, I, I mean, was sitting with Daniel and him and I were sitting around actually in Vancouver 20 odd years ago. So it's a long time ago when he came out with his first book and we were, we were talking and the story that he told that for me that was the most powerful was when he talked about being the sniper and shooting at the general and killing the general in front of the general's child. And he said, and then, you know, being himself in this experience of looking at his life as he's, you know, in the near death experience, looking at his life, traveling down the bullet being hit in the head by so be, then being the general who is who is taken out and then being then having the sense of being the child who sees his father killed and then flipping that back into being the sniper who had become completely compartmentalized and not feeling anything and i just went that's the message the world needs to hear is that there's you know, and I, I, in the work that we do, I talk about the implication of the implication, the ripple effect of everything that you're doing. And it doesn't, it doesn't stop with you directly. And that's, I think, a message that we need to get clear on. Do you agree on that? I, I think it's huge. And that's why in my podcast, which is an eight episode series, we have a whole episode on the life review. And one of the reports that a scientist who studies this told me is a woman who in her life review felt the pain of the cashier in the store because she mistreated the cashier. She wasn't very nice. And therefore each person in the line who came up later was not treated as well because the cashier was in a worse mood. And so when we think about the ripple effects, then each of those people maybe goes home and they're not as nice to their family incrementally because the cashier wasn't as nice. So every one of these little acts, seemingly little has a huge effect. And yeah. there's a, in science, there's something called chaos theory, the butterfly effect butterfly, where, yeah. We know from just looking at the math, the butterfly flapping its wings in China can cause a hurricane on the East Coast of the US, just mathematically. So small, mm -hmm. tiny changes in initial conditions can have a massive effect. Yeah, there's a lovely little video on social media right now of, of a, a, a lady who bumps into a guy as she's walking down the street uh, and because she's not paying attention. Then she gives him shit for it. And then he looks to his belly and he has a black ball and he carries the black ball and then he bumps, uh, he sort of runs into somebody or something happens and that person, he gets upset with that person. And then suddenly they have the black ball and it's all this suddenly passing this black ball. And it's a wonderful example of, by giving it a physicality, of course, of this transference that we do. And I think that, you know, psychologically we can understand transference, but it's also metaphysically and quantum physically is the understanding of the shift in the consciousness. And we can add there's some phenomenal research on that uh, in the, in the world of epigenetics and the shift in, in the consciousness changing the DNA of the human being you're interacting with, which in and of itself is quite phenomenal. I mean, we look at astronauts and we see that there was a great piece of research around uh, twins and one of the astronauts was one of the one of these twins was an astronaut who went to space and when they came back their DNA would changed and it wasn't they weren't quite twins anymore mm. uh, <clears throat> and so the question was was it space this is the deeper you know question you and I will like the question was was the shift because the person had been to space or because the effect psychologically being in space at for instance watching the sunrise every 90 minutes right? The shift in, in consciousness that, that person has suddenly had. And that's the deeper question. Yes, going to space had changed the person, but had that changed the DNA or was the consciousness of that individual changed the DNA? Is it just a phenomenal way of understanding that we are impacted and we are impacting? And so you, you are the result of and you are the creator of in everybody in who you having uh, an interaction with 
for me is this like wake up i mean for me it's a very it can feel I, and i know this because i have these conversations with people, it can feel very ominous because it feels like a lot of responsibility mm-hmm. What would you say to somebody who says, you know, this is too much for me? I've gotten that response a number of times. And I think it's, sure. up, it's up to everyone. If it's too much, then, then there's no obligation to pursue it. I just know for me personally, I think it's best for me to align with reality, whatever reality is, whether I like it or not. It's not up to me to judge what, what's fair or not. But this is what seems to be the nature of reality based on all the science. And therefore, it seems to be most advantageous for me to align with it. Even yeah, if it's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> I agree. And, and, and the, the wonderful thing about it, as I said to you when we preach at it, um, you know, I spent the first part of my life traveling the world to study with spiritual masters and, and study Vedanta, which is uh, Hindu philosophy, Buddhism, the Tao, Gnostic Christianity, Coptic Christianity, and Kabbalah. You know, and here's what I found, that every one of those at their deeper sense, not at religion, but at the religious philosophy, talked about everything that you and I are talking about in the context of science, and quantum physics and entanglement and, uh, and the impact that we're having. And, and so it's like, huh, hmm, you know, these guys must have been tuned into something two, 3,000 years ago or more uh, that we are now going, here's the science on it. I think it's kind of, we have to wake up and, and you know, that's my mission is to wake people up, not woke, which is something else altogether, but to wake them up. What do you, what is it that you want people to really walk away from reading the book with? What is it that you want them to really get more than anything? Well, it's interesting you talk about waking up because the second to last line in the season finale of my podcast is it's time for us to wake up. So mm-hmm. I'm completely in agreement with you that we're, I think at least I know this from personal experience, I was totally lost in just in terms of how I thought about life. And it's because I had no exposure to any of this material. Right. So as we come towards the, the end of the show, and we're in the last part of the show here, I want to um, address something. I want to do a little bit of a quick fire round. But before I do that, uh, and, which, and at the end of which, I'll give you an opportunity to share with our viewers and our listeners where they can find out more about you and all your resources. But let's start here. We're going to start on a metaphysical, quantum physical question that I often ask people who don't actually get it, but I think you will. And that is, in a parallel universe, what do you do? Mm, that's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question for you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what I'm doing right now is what I want to be doing. And I think I'd be doing the exact same thing in a parallel universe. So no, I, I would suggest to you that in a parallel universe, you are your old self. You know, according, according to you, Everett the Third, every 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 choice point creates a new universe. So there is a there is a universe going on where you're still at a banker. Yeah, and probably a future. I mean, if this is all beyond space and time, there's probably a future version of me. In a of course, too. Of course, we could. some future time. Because time is our our particular concept, and not not much to do with reality. So yeah, maybe in yours you're 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 a banker somewhere. Yeah, uh, I've uh, I actually had an exercise that I used to teach you around this, and uh, uh, that I had taught myself when I was 22, and that was to uh, when I no 23 when I first read you ever the third's uh, multi multiple re, re, multiple reality uh, theory and. I remember doing this exercise where I planned out, well, what is my parallel universes? And I make sure today, to this day, um, that I uh, go visit my other selves occasionally to remind me if this is the right path, Mm -hmm. to remind me if I'm actually on the path that's best for me. Because there is a part of this, in one of my universes, I'm a fairly heavy drinker and a user of drugs, and I'm a pretty miserable old guy. You know, I'm old has got nothing to do with chronology. Um, it's got everything to do with just being old and worn out. And I and I, I like to go visit that guy because of like, oh yeah, that's why I work out. That's why I meditate. That's why I eat healthy. That's why I'm consciousness. That's why I love and care because I don't want to be him. And that universe is always available. And that's the interesting thing about when you start looking at that is like, it's one decision away from that one universe. 
That's right. And we're making those decisions all day long. So all having this awareness long. is really important because it drives, yeah. it's the compass that drives all of our decisions. Thank you. And that's what I want people to grasp. It's a, it's, a, it's a compass that you have to check on a regular basis. You can't assume because you checked it once and you were headed north that you're still going north. You may very well be now headed south and you didn't even know you got turned around. So that, that's a really good point. Thank you. So, Mark, tell us, quick fire round, uh, what's a guilty pleasure for Mark Gobler? Sweets. I love sweets. Any particular kind? Cookies, cake, ice cream. Oh, you like Any, anything decadent? <laughs> Just like ma- mainline sugar. Yeah. <laughs> what What is something you learned in the last little while that really like rocked your world? Hmm. I've been looking a little bit at the work of Graham Hancock looking at human oh, yeah? history and the potential that human, the, the linear human history that we've been looking at isn't correct. And I haven't looked at it more closely enough, but it's made me think about what's actually happened on this planet and are we going to be discovering things that will blow us away? Mm-hmm. Well, Hancock's work is certainly fascinating. And when we look at Babylonian texts and, and uh, those texts, it, uh, we really seem to have our history a little bit, twisted but hey that's what we do you know as the, as we, as the as the saying goes history is written by the victors and often erased by those same victors too mm-hmm. so that's pretty interesting stuff very cool and um when you think <laughs> so when you when you uh when you are having downtime what what is a what what do you like to do that that is not related to what you're doing? I like to make sure I'm working out a lot. Growing up, I was a competitive tennis player, and again in college, then I went to investment banking, and I didn't work out at all because I was working all night. And now, when I have downtime, I'm trying to be in the gym or doing workout classes. Very cool. <laughs> so, what's the one piece of as we finish up, what's the one piece of practical advice, so it has to be practical, that you want our listeners, our viewers to get so they can put into action? Well, I think one that's been helpful for me is the practice of surrender. We mentioned David Hawkins at the beginning of the show. He wrote a book called Letting Go, The Pathway of Surrender. And it's the, the idea that we, we surrender our individual volition and kind of allow things to happen more than trying to control everything. And that's been a really difficult thing for me to do because my whole life was about controlling everything and letting go a little bit and stepping back and doing my best, but being a bit more receptive in the way that I receive the world and go about living has changed things dramatically. And it's something that's still constantly a practice because my instinct is to go back to controlling mode. And then I kind of remind myself to surrender to the situation don't resist it, allow what's happening to be there, whether it's an emotion or something around me, and then deal with, from, deal with it from that place. That's a good piece of advice, that tension that we all feel, um, which is to trust and let go, you know, and at the same time to control and is an interesting tension between those two points because uh, controlling everything doesn't work at all. Uh, and, and, uh, really letting go completely is a way to be a victim and a way to feel like, you know, you're being bashed on the rocks and there's a wonderful story of a creature who lives on the bottom of, of the, the bottom of the river. And as he lives on the bottom of the river, he's surrounded by other creatures who live on the bottom of the river. Uh, and, and he says to his friends one day, I'm going to let go. And they say, why you got to cling to the bottom if you don't the the current will smash you on the rocks and he says i'm gonna let go and they said you'll be smashed on the rocks you'll be killed and he says well i can't bear this anymore i can't bear clinging to life the way that i cling and so he lets go and he is smashed upon the rocks for a while and then he is lifted in the current and carried by the current and as he's carried by the current the next creatures further down the river who cling to the rocks look up and say, oh, look, a god who flies. Mm. It's a wonderful analogy of where we need to let go and when we need to hang on. It's a great story. 
Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure having you here. Please share with our listeners, our viewers, more about you and all your resources and where people can get a hold of your book and tune into your podcast and all the wonderful resources that you have. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been fun talking to you. My book is called An End to Upside Down Thinking, and it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, many other bookstores. My podcast is called Where Is My Mind? It's available on Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, all the major players. And my website is my name, markgober.com, M-A-R-K-G-O-B-E-R.com. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure having you here. And I hope you'll stay with us to the end. And I hope that you, dear listener, will make sure that you go. Maybe you want to listen to this show a couple of times because there's some really juicy stuff in here for you to really think about and chew on and let yourself marinate in. And of course, you can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any past episodes by going into our there are LinkedIn groups or our Facebook group. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. To find out how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a speaker or strategist for your organization, go over to fullmontyleadership.com forward slash consulting or fullmontyleadership.com forward slash speaking. Please be aware that the research consistently shows that the fastest growing companies face the same challenges you do. They're spending time, money, energy, and effort attracting, training, and developing top talent only to have them leave at an alarming rate. If you're frustrated with investing in the training and development of your talent, only have them leave before you get your ROI and come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose. fullmontyleadership.com because you can't outsource authenticity. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you are impacting everybody and everything around you. And that you are not in this world alone, but that you are connected and entangled with everybody you've ever met, ever do know, and ever will know. So next time, I'm Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach the next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out. Mm-hmm.